afternoon. Please uh, keep eating and, and don't be shy about getting up to uh, get seconds during the course of our session today. My name is Tom Banshoff. I know most of you here. I'm director of the Berkeley Center and it's a great honor and pleasure to welcome you to the second in a series of talks, lunchtime seminars that we're holding on religion and modernity in China, today featuring Mayfair Yang. And before I introduce Mayfair, just a couple of words about our work on China here at the Berkeley Center and at Georgetown. Um, it's an area a lot of universities are engaged in, having a China strategy, a China policy. And at Georgetown, uh, we're doing many things. But one of the things we're doing uh, is trying to draw out uh, colleagues in China, civil society, universities, and even in the government. Uh, into a broader dialogue about religion and its role in our changing world. And as part of that effort, uh, we've got several things going. One is a visiting postdoc, Dr. Leong Dai here, to my right, has been with us almost two years now, uh, and uh, is a living embodiment of intellectual exchange, and he'll be giving uh, the third uh, seminar on April 15th here in this room, so I hope you can join us uh, for that. And that's a continuing program founded by the, uh, or supported by the Walton Family Foundation to bring a young scholar of religious studies from China to Georgetown every year to work here at the Berkeley Center. The second activity I would highlight is work we're doing on a website uh, in Chinese and in English designed as a resource for people around the world, in the Chinese speaking world, English speaking world, who want to learn more about religion as it relates to issues of culture, society, uh, politics and world affairs. And that involves uh, some intercultural work, involves some translation, involves some thinking together about categories, knowledge, what's important. Dr. Dai is part of that, as are our faculty and our student assistants here at the center. So that's an exciting project. We hope to have the first version of that out in the next couple of months. Finally, I'd mention our dialogue with the Chinese leadership about religion. Uh, President DeJoya uh, signed an agreement with the head of the State Administration for Religious Affairs in China that calls for an annual dialogue around questions of religion, culture, and society. And the Berkeley Center is the arm of the university engaged in organizing and executing that piece of the agreement. We had a first dialogue here uh, last uh, fall in this room. The, the Chinese Minister for Religious Affairs, Ye Wen, was here along with the delegation. We had a very spirited exchange on a range of different topics, and that's a dialogue we'll continue into the future with a meeting uh, in Beijing sometime later this year. So just three examples of how we're trying to broaden the conversation about religion and world affairs and engage with China more specifically. Let me now turn to the introduction of our speaker today, Mayfair Yang, who I think is known to many of you already through her academic reputation. It's actually her first trip to Georgetown, so let's really be on her best behavior. Um, She's Director of Asian Studies at the University of Sydney in Australia and a Professor of Religious Studies in East Asian Languages and Cultures at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She is a leading scholar in the area of Asian Studies, understood in a very broad sense. She's a, an anthropologist, an anthropologist of religion, but someone who works on a variety of interdisciplinary questions uh, related to modernity, to politics, to gender, to media just to name a few of those intersections. I won't list all of her publications, but I want to highlight uh, this book that just came out, I'm told, when, just a week or two ago, Mayfair? Uh, no, last year, end of last year. End of last year, uh, called Chinese Religiosities, Afflictions of Modernity and State Formation. So you can see the intersection here with some of the topics and themes that I've already addressed came out end of 2008 with the University of California Press. So I recommend this book to you. I'll actually pass it around during our session on the condition that it finds its way back to me. Okay, so <laughs> I know how these things work. Um, other books include uh, an often cited book on gifts, favors, and banquets, the art of social relationships in China. Uh, and I'll, I'll mention maybe uh, that she's also done documentar documentary films based on some of her field work in Southeast China as well. Uh, she spent time at many prestigious academic institutions, has won prizes and fellowships, has been at the University of Michigan, at Harvard, Chicago, the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, and we're delighted to have her 
with us today. So with that, thank you for joining us, Mayfair. We look forward to your presentation. Thanks very much. I'm very happy to uh, be back in the United States and um, very honored to be invited uh, to Georgetown University and the Berkeley Center. And um, I spent um, my youth um, in Washington, D.C. as an intern at the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. <laughs> so I have some experience living in D.C. Okay, today um, I couldn't remember the title that I gave um, Tom, so I just put in the title of my uh, in-progress book on uh, Wenzhou, China, uh, which is what I'm going to be talking about. <clears throat> okay, so let me give you a quick uh, rundown of uh, modern Chinese history as it relates to religious matters. Um, as you know, uh, there was the Opium War, uh, 1840s, that uh, severely traumatized uh, uh, late imperial China. And um, there was a, uh, a violation of Chinese sovereignty. Uh, I, and I thematize this because I have the, the term sovereignty in my uh, book title. And I will go a little bit into this. Hopefully I have time, it's uh, rather theoretical. Um, <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> and then there was, uh, you know, the Western powers, they um, were uh, pretty uh, uh, nervous about Chinese law, so they demanded extraterritoriality which meant that uh, uh, Westerners who commit crimes in China would uh, not be subject to Chinese law, even though they're on Chinese soil in the Qing Dynasty, but they could only be uh, subject to Western law. This was a kind of violation of Chinese sovereign uh, state. Um, and then um, in the late Qing Dynasty, uh, winds of uh, social evolutionism were blowing uh, in China, and uh, there was a translation of, uh, of uh, uh, Huxley's um, Evolution and Ethics, which were, made a tremendous impact amongst the educated elite in um, modern China. Uh, and uh, so uh, this, the social evolutionism, as, as some, some of you have studied uh, in the 19th century, was um, really uh, a doctrine that um, kind of was was uh, really put together to, in many ways, explain the success of Western capitalism, and it had built generally built hierarchies of the world's uh, cultures and societies, uh, so that, uh, for example, uh, Henry Louis Morgan, who you know anthropologists are more familiar with, but there were many others besides Henry Louis Morgan who subscribed to the stages of uh, social development theories. So uh, Morgan had this um, uh, theory of uh, stage of uh, savagery, barbarism, and civilization. And this was an upward movement of progress uh, and development in technology, uh, ideas, uh, and religion. There were also theories of uh, religious evolution. And um, so this idea of backwardness and progress and the, the, the uh, emancipation and liberation uh, uh, and material uh, prosperity that the West was at the pinnacle of. So the West, there were very many, each of these three stages had many substages. And the lowest of the low were the Australian Aborigines because that was based on their technology. They mainly had digging sticks and even, you know, food carriers, water carriers, but but in terms of their religious imagination and their kinship structures, Australian Aborigines just blows the mind because they're so sophisticated. Uh, and so when you have this kind of materialism that measures people and grades them according to you know how superior they are, it's rather deadly. So um, this, though, took deep roots in modern China. and. Uh, really affected the severe, uh, produced the severe secularization uh, that uh, came down uh, in, throughout modern, the 20th century. 
Next, we have the May 4th uh, movement, which was a movement of urban educated people. Uh, May 4th occurred in 1919, and this led to a whole uh, changing of uh, popular discourse throughout China towards, uh, towards nationalism, patriotism, and a, a more firm footing for social evolutionist uh, thought. Uh, and there, it was also the, the beginning uh, of attacks against traditional religions, including, uh, most of all, uh, Confucianism. Uh, and so May 4th intellectuals uh, wanted to westernize, uh, and the only way they could see to modernization was that all those backward things uh, must be um, uh, dismantled and destroyed. Uh, and so, and they were in a rush because of the situation of being a semi-colony of the West, uh, and uh, later uh, impingement on Chinese territory by the Japanese. So uh, the the country was in a, a very uh, severe state of crisis, and um, it was beginning around the May Fourth period in 1920s that. Uh, you know, intellectuals and students would go into the countryside and uh, smash idols and uh, try to get the peasants to uh, depart from their ignorance and superstitions. Then um, the state, in the form of the early Republican government after the collapse of the Qing Dynasty, also started sending out, uh, you know, uh, uh, state agents into the countryside to close down temples uh, and so forth, uh, and attack uh, so-called superstition. And 1949 was a communist revolution uh, in the midst of, you know, after se severe losses and traumas of warfare, uh, anti-Japanese war, uh, and um, the civil war between the communists and uh, Kuomintang party. Uh, and uh, uh, communism, as you know, have a, um, they, they believe that they're fully part of the sub, uh, social evolutionist uh, discourse, uh, and they have a progressive linear uh, narrative uh, of history. And um, they thought that uh, uh, Marx's words were, um, religion is the opium of the people and a cry of, uh, of uh, pain and suffering. Um, and uh, this was taken as a very central platform of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, there was a lot of um, confiscation of uh, monastic uh, land and uh, forced uh, defrocking of monks and nuns, and uh, things got very dangerous. Uh, to pursue religious activities. Uh, public rituals were just no longer seen uh, for the most part. Um, of course, religious persecution really um, came out uh, in the movement, the smashing of the four olds in the Cultural Revolution, and um, so sort of where it became rather dangerous uh, to continue to pursue it. Uh, but of course, it was not even really spread throughout the country, um, but you've made uh, sort of risks if you uh, pursued religious activities. Um, and the uh, Chinese Communist uh, Party bureaucracy uh, really firmly uh, had implanted in its kind of unconscious, this uh, both unconscious as well as conscious uh, program, the separation between religion, so-called religion, and feudal superstition. And I, talk about this in the introduction of my book here. Um, so this separation between religion, which is seen as more advanced and more permissible, and in fact, freedom of religion was in the 1953 uh, Chinese constitution, uh, uh, although it was not really put into practice until more recently. Um, and, uh, and feudal superstitions. Uh, actually, the irony is that <laughs> This separation between religion and feudal, feudal superstition came out of the Western Reformation. It's a Western separation. And just as the notion of, inter, uh, of religion was introduced as a modern concept into China, and really doesn't sit very well 
uh, to describe China's religious traditions. And that's why I use the term religiosities uh, in my um, title of my book. Um, and I don't have time to go into that, but there, uh, suffice to say, right now, uh, the Chinese uh, state bureaucracy recognizes only five religions. That's uh, Buddhism, Taoism, Islam, Catholicism, and Protestantism. Uh, no other uh, religious traditions are recognized. Uh, everything else falls into this very gray legal category called feudal superstitions, uh, which are really technically illegal if uh, local governments or whatever provincial governments wish to uh, prosecute and pursue and uh, condemn uh, these other religious traditions such as uh, ancestor worship, divination, um, shamanism, spirit mediumship, um, feng shui, all these are considered feudal superstitions and they're monitored by a separate branch uh, of the government and so religious affairs who we were talking with, that only handles the five religions. And uh, the other feudal superstitions, uh, new religions, uh, Falun Gong include, that you know, uh, falls under this category. They have a separate bureaucracy to deal with them, including the police, the public security agency, is saddled with the task. So this is the, the brief, very brief whirlwind history of um, modern China as a backdrop. Now, since I'm an, a cultural anthropologist, I do field work, and since 1991, I've been down here in Wenzhou, which is just north of Fuzhou, uh, in southern Zhejiang province. It's right on the coast, where, you know, long fishing tradition, as well as tradition of piracy and smuggling. Mm -hmm. And here's a satellite uh, image of the area where I first started to do field work. This is Wenzhou Airport. Uh, this is the old river. And the red spots are my GPS points for all the religious revival points, whether it be ancestor, lineage ancestor hall, uh, Catholic church, Protestant church, or um, um, Taoist temple, or Buddhist temple. And as part of uh, getting out of being labeled a feudal superstition, many um, local deity temples have uh, relabeled themselves and uh, uh, so that they can get recognized and registered by the state uh, because the state only recognizes five religions. So uh, to be totally legal, you have to, can, you can no longer be a, just a local deity cult, you have to become Taoism. Taoism is the sort of become the umbrella for the collecting of popular religious activity in China. And so they've been, uh, I know this one guy who happens to be a Communist Party member, but he's also become, um, he trained himself uh, as a Taoist priest. So that's also illegal, but uh, lots of Ill illegal things go on in China. And that's kind of the, the beauty of China is that it's not a very law abiding um, society. Uh, and actually that is its strength since many laws are not are uh, unreasonable. <laughs> and this is the same uh, area in the Ming Dynasty map. You can see all the water uh, waterways. These are transport canals. Uh, late Imperial China, beginning from the Song Dynasty, uh, that's um, 900, uh, 900 to 1100 uh, Common Era, um, was uh, extremely commercialized. Uh, one of the questions this uh, gentleman was asking about um, why um, post-Soviet Russia did not develop as fast as China. I said one of the reasons is this long uh, imperial um, commercialization of China, that it's often not recognized in the West that China was capitalist before the term capitalism. Um, so we have a long, you know, you had in the Song Dynasty this tremendous urban revolution, uh, commercial revolution, and the invention of printing in China uh, about three, four hundred years before the Gutenberg Bible. And uh, and uh, so so vi very vibrant in southern China commercial activity. And what I want to talk about today is really the relationship between the ritual economy today in Wenzhou uh, and um, the um, market economy. But here I have a little quick uh, 
I wasn't sure whether I should bring these guys up because uh, it might uh, turn people off. But uh, a quick uh, theoretical interlude to introduce you to the theoretical sort of impetus uh, or thrust of my book, which uh, is an interminable project. Michel Foucault and Giorgio Algamben. Um, but most of you probably know Foucault uh, Based, uh, Foucault's discussion of governmentality. It's this kind of um, uh, care of the population, uh, a kind of new mo modern mode of power that uh, uh, works not through repression, uh, a top-down kind of force, uh, but it's capillary, it's diffuse, it works not just it through the state but also in civil society uh, where there's kind of disciplinary uh, processes going on and the creation and construction of subjects and the penetration of these subjects' interiority. So like modern psychology is very much part of modern modes of governmentality. But Foucault named also another kind of power and this is the power that political scientists tend to focus on, and that's uh, what he called monarchical power. Uh, monarchical power uh, focuses, its object is territory rather than populations. Um, so it's more uh, interested in expanding territory and the resources that territory will bring to the power of the sovereign. And it works uh, through juridical systems, the, the power of the law, legal system, and before modern times, imperial royal edicts and commands. It works, uh, um, so, okay. So then Giorgio Agamben comes along and produces, uh, this Italian philosopher produces a gentle critique of uh, Foucault, because Foucault was also suggest he's inconsistent about this, but he was also suggesting that in modernity, what you have is a decline of monarchical, juridical power and the growth of this kind of capillary governmentality that works through, uh, that is productive rather than repressive. Giorgio Galgamben comes along, and I think his intervention is very valuable, especially when we think about places like China. Uh, Foucault, of course, was talking about liberal democracies. Um, now, Giorgio Galgamben uh, says that uh, sovereign power has definitely not declined in modernity. Uh, and, but expanded, and he points to the modern totalitarianisms uh, that Foucault uh, did not discuss. Uh, and and um, he, he also uh, expounds upon uh, Foucault's notion of biopower, and he says that uh, biopower is not modern either. Uh, biopower, the, the ability to determine life and death, uh, is not modern. And it's as old as archaic states. And he spends uh, one third of his book, Homo Satcher, talking about the Roman Empire. Um, so modern states have always had this power and the right uh, to, to put to death or to let live. And um, so uh, a government talks about states of exception, but uh, I would say. Yes, this is very important in martial law, but uh, in China, in um, modern China, uh, because of the kinds of uh, regimes you've had, rather than uh, democratic uh, types of government, you don't even need to declare a state of exception. You don't need to declare martial law. It's permanent martial law. So actually, modern China is quite um, in line with Agamben's notion that uh, states of exception become the norm. Okay. So uh, let me, uh, I, sorry I don't have time to really get into this. Now there's another notion of sovereignty that I find extremely relevant to China, and that is Georges Bataille, uh, another uh, crazy French guy. Um, he was pretty crazy. Um, sovereignty, he says, is life beyond <coughs> utility, or the use of resources for non-productive ends. Uh, so he's, you can see already that he's really thinking about modern capitalism, its utilitarianism, its rationalism, and its materialism. And uh, he's making uh, a jab uh, at modern capitalism. <coughs> um, sovereignty, but he's taking, uh, he's using Marxist uh, theory, but he really very much departs from Marx, and that's why I really like him. Um, sovereignty 
For him, it's freedom from alienation or escape from being turned into a thing, a mere instrument of productive activity. And for Bataille, modern industrial societies have lost the ability, uh, this would include at this point China, uh, to engage in non-productive consumption, which you know, we, we humans always had in human history, which was this, this human propensity, which was really healthy, for squandering excess wealth, uh, which we find in traditional religious sacrifices, festivals, and building of great monuments. Um, so you, you think about the um, pyramids of ancient Egypt. Uh, he said, um, you know, those, the, those um, pyramids had really no utilitarian function, but huge uh, m amounts of wealth and human labor were deployed to build them. But they could have just uh, you know, dug a giant hole in the ground uh, for all the functionality of that project. But uh, archaic societies and, and um, more recently uh, traditional societies knew how to counterbalance productive activities with non-productive ritual expenditures. So he saw uh, what moderns have, you know, we moderns have totally shrunk this uh, archaic ancient tradition of um, non-productive religious expenditures, whether it be ritual sacrifice, religious festivals, uh, and all this. And he saw in that a, an example of uh, human freedom, okay? Because it's where we, we stop becoming mere tools uh, and things uh, and objects, but we actually are reaching out to access uh, the divine through these religious expenditures uh, that will um, help us, uh, you know, access and, and go back to a, a period uh, of uh, lacking. And here's where he kind of waxes Taoist, uh, lacking the differentiation between um, humanity and, and natural processes. He has great uh, um, opening for his book, History of Religions, where he get, he makes you enter the state, the mental state of being of a cow. Because a cow does not have this subject-object separation. A cow is not a tool and is not afraid of death. Anyway, I can't <laughs> go into that. Um, so I'm going to, the rest of the talk is about this strange place of China, which is the longest continuous uh, civilization in the world. Uh, and here you see two Song Dynasty pagodas totally encompassed by modern industrial society. Uh, and you know, when I first saw this scene, and here's a new railway line uh, coming through. Uh, this is in Changnan County of Wenzhou. And you can see a Catholic church back here that uh, I was horrified when I saw this from a hilltop uh, you know how can they totally disrespect ancient heritage these are Song Dynasty uh, Buddhist um, pagodas okay so I think that any kind of uh, study of China must take in the long durée you must have this kind of historical perspective on China because uh, there's a strange uh, continuity about Chinese uh, culture uh, and uh, it's, it's really funny but uh, uh, when you read the Chinese Confucian classics then you go out on the streets and you talk to workers or ordinary peasants and they will spout out ancient thought without even themselves having read any of this stuff. Here's something written in the Qing Dynasty, 18th century, by a Confucian uh, gentry person. Uh, the local custom of the people in Wenzhou is to support spirit mediums and get access to spirits and ghosts. They hold elaborate Buddhist ceremonies and Taoist rituals, engaging in extravagant expenditures and exhausting their energies. Unconcerned with heavy-duty wastefulness, this is a notion that Batai really focuses on. Each year during the first lunar month, they hold a lantern festival that lasts over 10 days. These attract festival goers late into the night, the men mixing freely with the women, which he disapproves of. They also get into competitions of dragon lanterns with fine detailed craft work. Over several tens of uh, gold pieces are wasted on a single large dragon lantern. 
gongs and drums are beaten, the boisterous din is insane. In just a few days, the dragon lanterns are put to the torch. This sort of reckless wastefulness must be immediately prohibited. <coughs> the funny thing is that the Chinese Communist Party talks pretty much the same way today. It sounds like the Beijing Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, that's a state ritual. So <laughs> that's a different. That's a secular okay. state ritual. <laughs> With, with a lot of utilitarian outcomes. Um, so now the, the, the area that I uh, have done field work in um, is called Wenzhou, and it's known in China, and especially amongst Chinese economists, as the Wenzhou model, because this is, area is an example of economic success. Uh, even before Mao was dead and buried, uh, the people, local people started privatizing and dividing up the land uh, and uh, secretly. And these, these local people, they have that long, late imperial Chinese commercial tradition. And they also have a very, coastal people generally have this kind of rebellious spirit against the central government. And you find this especially in places like Taiwan. Uh, and uh, Wenzhou is on the other side of the straits, but they share a common kind of culture. Um, so the Wenzhou model, be, be, Wenzhou was dirt poor in the 1970s. It was one of the poorest rural areas of China because these people didn't take very well to collectivization. Um, but then um, it just bubbled up and, and uh, out of poverty, uh, they um, just had this economic miracle. So there are, amongst economists and sociologists, they always, uh, when they talk about the Wenzhou model, they point to uh, the top four things. And what I'd like to uh, discuss uh, after I get through with this list is the ritual economy, which all of them have ignored, and which I think is the secret of Wenzhou's economic success and prosperity. One, they talk about the extreme privatization. So uh, Wenzhou's uh, model is based on household economy, where the household is the unit, basic unit of production. You have a lot of rural industries uh, uh, run by family firms. So these are so because of the importance of family and kinship in traditional Chinese culture. Uh, and so you have a lot of family-run uh, small clinics that are privately owned, small factories where they're uh, making uh, um, pipe, uh, pipe parts and, um, you know, what do you call those, valve switches uh, or leather shoes and, and so on, all kinds of different things. Uh, then you have, uh, they point to indigenous capital. This is an area that got, uh, got um, uh, successful not through any outside investment by overseas Chinese uh, nor from uh, central or provincial government investment. They did it with primitive accumulation methods, uh, rotating credit societies that date back to um, late imperial China's commercialized society. And so there's a very strong ethos of local initiative. Uh, in this area, you can uh, people like to be bosses, law back on their own. They don't like to be employees. Uh, who do they get to work in their factories? Well, they get the people from the migrant laborers from the interior, many of whom live in their homes. Uh, so these are family firms. They all like to be their own bosses. Third is that you have a tremendous mobility of people and goods. There are Wenzhou people in New York City, in Paris, and Italy, and also throughout, they found out throughout all of China, every Chinese small town, provincial town, large city has their window section because these people are very entrepreneurial. Um, and their goods go all over China. Um, they have a huge domestic market and as well as um, international. And uh, Russians go there um, to, to buy things and so forth. Um, then there are the growth of new rural towns. Uh, small sleepy villages have blossomed into uh, rural towns. Rural towns have blossomed into uh, sizable um, uh, prefectural cities and so forth. There's tremendous growth of urbanism. So let's get to ritual economy and what I mean by that. Oh, i uh, just show you some quick pictures of, uh, of uh, 
family firms. This is a family-owned uh, shoemaking factory. And this is uh, various privately owned trucking industry. You can see uh, shipping or Wenzhou goods all over China, Shanghai, Chengdu, Guangzhou, Shandong, and so forth. And there's been a lot of uh, infrastructure building, new roads, an airport has been put in, a railway station has been introduced. Uh, so before, why these people are so independent of the centralized state? Uh, it's one is their language, which is incomprehensible anywhere else in China. And second, that's probably coming from the pirate Japanese, the Korean pirates uh, in the Ming Dynasty, mixed in with local Chinese. And another one is, um, um, their geographical isolation, because on one side is the ocean and they're surrounded by mountains, so the central government has had trouble. So that's why there's so much preservation and as well as a strong revival of traditional Chinese uh, religious culture. Here's one of these uh, irrigation canals, I mean uh, transport canals, and this is a, uh, a picture of a, um, a walled uh, town uh, that is, uh, most of these uh, townspeople are, um, belong to the Wang lineage, and here's the lineage ancestor of all here uh, that has been re reconstructed. And this, this wall is built uh, because of the pirate attacks uh, on the coast. And the pirate attacks have to do with uh, Ming Dynasty central government uh, policy uh, banning um, commercialized uh, trade for commoners that only the state could engage in commerce with foreigners. Uh, and this is the town wall here, you can see, and then there's a Catholic church over here. And this is just a street scene, and uh, these uh, pedicabs are very popular to get people around. Okay, what do I mean by ritual economy? Um, one, it's the, the sacrifices. So lineage organizations have been uh, revived, and uh, they've been at, were very busy since the 1980s rebuilding and restoring um, old lineage ancestor halls. And uh, lineages come together once or twice a year to offer sacrifices to their deceased ancestors. Lineages have revived the practice of uh, uh, reconstructing their um, genealogies. Uh, back to a founding male ancestor. Um, there's uh, rituals, uh, uh, Buddhist festivals, uh, and offerings made uh, to Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. There's um, um, life cycle rituals, weddings, funerals, um, childbirth ceremonies, house building ceremonies, all these, all these uh, Taoist rituals and so forth, all these require economic expenditures, okay? they all are part of the thriving economy and they all contribute to stimulating the local economy. These have been totally left out by economists and sociologists. And uh, some of you may have uh, attended uh, Chinese banquets and that is a, a, an ancient Chinese tradition that is thriving in capitalist China. And uh, the, the, there are certain rituals and etiquettes about banquet giving. One primary rule about banquet giving is the principle of generosity, okay? And you've all been, in a, uh, those who have attended Chinese banquets, your host probably made you eat too much and drink too much. And as soon as you lift a piece of food from your t uh, plate, they immediately, you know, heap uh, three times more on your plate. This ethos of generosity is very important and there's a religious dimension. The more you donate, here's our next uh, donations and charities, the more you donate to the gods, uh, to, to sacrifices for the ancestors, to honoring your ancestors, uh, the more you donate to Buddhist temples, uh, you know, some Buddhist temple maybe burned down recently, electrical short, uh, immediately the local people will rush to donate uh, on their own volition, okay? Very often it's on their own volition. And for in Buddhist uh, theology, uh, you donate because you, and you accumulate merit. Uh, you're paying for the sins of your past life. You accumulate merit. There's a huge um, 
even go to some temples. I went to a city god temple, and there was a giant uh, swan pan, <laughs> the, uh, what do you call it, abacus. Yeah. And the, there's, a, there's somebody out there, there's a, a divine force out there who keeps accounts. Merit, demerit, this deed was bad, demerit, one point down. Oh, this deed is good, uh, one point up. So when you die, you're held to account for all this. What, what is the outcome of your good deeds and balance sheet of the bad deeds? Um, and especially who donates a lot? The entrepreneurs, the wealthy ones. Uh, you know, they're enjoying this good life. They better make some investments for the afterlife. There is a kind of, uh, this calculation is at work here. So for Chinese, they're very good at calculating. They know immediately, like some of these Chinese born students in the United States or in Australia, they know how to calculate, oh, it's good for me to come this year because the exchange rate is better, you know, they're very good at that. But there's a religious dimension, and in fact, a lot of, um, so late imperial Chinese commercialization had this religious dimension to it. Uh, and there's a, it's a kind of chicken and egg question. Did uh, the market economy uh, produce a thriving religious domain? Or did the religious domain produce the market? And it's a really mutual stimulus kind of a, uh, a thing, mutual feedback relation. There is a construction of religious sites, te new temples, Taoist, Buddhist, uh, deity temples, ancestor uh, halls, um, graves, uh, ancestor tombs, and so on are uh, being built, churches. Uh, there's uh, gift giving, the circulation of gifts, different kinds of gift. I don't have time to go into that. Divination and geomancy. Now, for the, your family firm, when is the, an auspicious date for you to open this new shop that you're planning? you better consult a diviner and figure it out exactly the right day, the right time. And um, is this marriage of your daughter going to be good to this family? You know, maybe they look pretty good on paper, but you know, you better consult somebody. Uh, there's geomancy, uh, feng shui. Uh, probably I shouldn't use the word geomancy anymore because everybody in the United States probably knows what feng shui is. It's a kind of divination through the land. Uh, these feng shui masters will go out. If you want to build a tomb to your ancestor, you better consult a, a, a feng shui master uh, to make sure that you know, the grave, the, the tomb, is aligned properly with the flow of the qi through the earth uh, and is positioned near flowing water so that that carries a good fortune because this will determine your family fortunes. And here, because the family is the basic unit of production, there is no differentiation between family and commercial firm. Okay, so what's good for your family is also good for your economic procedure. So divination ties in with the economy uh, in that you're doing it for your business as well as your family and your family's descendants. It's a long time for it to switch. Okay, so just uh, some imagery of how religious expenditures and religious consumption, far from uh, uh, being regarded as wasteful and useless, really is an important part, uh, should be regarded as an important part of the uh, economy and the prosperity in China. It provides work for these people who, there's a, been a real growth in local artisanship and craftsmen, it takes a lot of money to build these, and huge amounts of money are expended on these new temples. You see all this fine artwork here. This is a, a ceiling inside a Taoist uh, temple. So you see, uh, brand new, and see the fine woodwork there. Uh, this is a uh, uh, this is in the same uh, Taoist uh, temple here. So there's a mixing, in popular Chinese religion, there's a mixing of um, Buddhist and Taoism, which goes back to the very early introduction of Buddhism, when a lot of Taoist concepts were used to translate Buddhist notions. And this is, uh, uh, this is uh, Guan Yin, so, but it's in a Taoist temple. And you see the, the uh, casting of uh, um, statues of the gods. Um, these are um, gold, what do you call it, gold leaf? Gold leaf, 
So they are really, uh, they want the best for their temples. Uh, they may scrimp and save in their um, homes and private lives, but they, you know, when it comes to honoring the gods, they want the best quality stuff. And this is a religious expenditure for funerals. Uh, funerals are a major event. Uh, there's more, sometimes more expenditures on funerals than for weddings. Uh, because funerals are tied into ancestor worship. So funerals are often more important than weddings. Okay, here are uh, lineage organizations. This is the Wang lineage, and these are some lineage elders. This man um, is a, a good friend, uh, and um, every time I go back, I visit with him. He is a very gentle soul. He served in the People's Liberation army and that's how he um, can speak Mandarin and I can talk with him and um, he is just an ordinary peasant a middle peasant uh, background uh, and he was very brave in that in 1981 he undertook to revive the Wong lineage uh, and for these people when I asked them why do you want to do this when the government is going to give you trouble and this is superstition uh, and he said well you know we cannot uh, stand by and uh, forget our an ancestors. We need that connection to our ancestors. We want to honor their memory uh, because they've done good, great things for us and left us all this. Uh, so he uh, was spearheaded the reconstruction of the Wang lineage uh, genealogy. Uh, he was called in many times to the public security office and grilled and even spent a few days in jail. But they always let him go because He's just an ordinary person, you know, and, and they could tell that, you know, he meant no harm. Uh, this guy, a uh, very um, ambitious entrepreneur, went off to Egypt and even saw the Great Pyramids. Uh, he was looking for new business opportunities in Egypt. And so this one is uh, the current lineage uh, head, uh, but he's, um, he's uh, uh, illiterate, he's a fisherman. Um, and so he does have a rival who's an educated, uh, a better educated man who is, um, so sometimes you get the situation where there's kind of dual leadership uh, and the, the other one is more in line with the state, but he is more kind of grassroots. So the state always tries to penetrate these organizations so as not to allow it to become too independent. Um, and, uh, but then there's the grassroots uh, the initiative too, and so there's a constantly a push and pull and a kind of uh, subtle uh, struggle going on within these organizations. This is an example of religious expenditure and tomb building. Uh, now the state, the local government, Guangzhou uh, city government, is opposed to these structures. And, uh, it comes, the, the, the government, the city government, the local government co makes raids on these tombs. So every once in a while they'll have a campaign to clear the hills. Uh, because, you know, more secular Chinese, uh, who, uh, you know, from big cities, because of the Wendell model success, they've got so many visitors, journalists, leader, party leaders, provincial uh, leaders, and county leaders from all over China come to visit and learn the secret of the Wendell miracle. And when they see these things, they just uh, turn a very disapproving eye, and they say, how can you be so uh, prosperous and advanced, but so backward in your religious revival? And so this then makes the local government very nervous. They don't want to be looked down upon. They don't want to get into trouble with the higher levels of the state structure. So they have raids against these, temple, uh, these uh, tombs, and they just uh, break it down and smash it. And, uh, but then the local people, uh, they're very persistent. And after a while, when things have quieted down, they'll go someplace else and build a new thing. But of course, that is a lot of uh, wasted expenditure. Here's a big one. So uh, this is divided up into generations. The older generation will be above, and then the younger generation below. And people look forward. It, it gives them a kind of tranquility facing death that uh, old people, you know, they, they feel very good when they, they know that their coffins are ready for them. 
up in the eaves in the in the farmhouse, and they know that a spot of land which is a good, very auspicious for with feng shui is already there waiting for them. They can go peacefully, um, knowing having this knowledge. This is a lineage ancestor hall, um, and this uh, dates back to 1542 in the Ming Dynasty. And I've written an article where I talk about the struggle within the lineage. And here's this uh, example of the state presence here. The state uh, wants to declare, has declared this uh, site a, uh, a museum. And it, the state makes uh, people pay tickets to enter this so-called museum. But at the same time, the lineage gets to use it uh, once or twice a year to uh, undertake their um, sacrifices to the ancestors, the ritual of sacrifice. Uh, here's another um, kind of storefront type uh, ancestor hall. And this is a fantastic ancestor hall. What does it remind you of, this structure here? Uh, Tiananmen, the Gate of Heavenly Peace in Beijing. Uh, now this lineage has huge ambitions. This is a Chen lineage. Um, and these are two Chen lineage uh, leaders showing me around here. This is in Qianku in uh, Wenzhou. But as you go up to it, here you see Zhong, Zhong Gong Qianku Zhen, uh, Chen Dong Chun Dang Zhi Hu. OK, so the party, the local village Three local village party headquarters are housed in the ancestor hall. And I was totally shocked uh, in 2004 when I saw this. I said to the lineage uh, leaders, how can you do this? How do they allow you to do this? This shouldn't be allowed in China. He said, oh, what does it matter? Those party members are one of us anyway. They're all Chen's. <laughs> So, so there's a subtle movement where the center of activity and local leadership has sort of shifted to some of these places. In other villages, you may have a temple as the center of uh, the village, uh, although I haven't seen any examples of the party headquarters moving into a, a religious temple yet. <coughs> Now this is a local deity temple. The goddess here is only worshipped in the Wenzhou area. So it's a very localized um, deity cult. And this image was taken in 1992. And so here you see it's a, it's a bedraggled kind of uh, uh, rundown little temple. And this is in 1998. Um, <coughs> see how much money has been put into this uh, very local temple to a local goddess. And of course, they, they have to be under the umbrella of the uh, Chinese uh, Taoist Association. This is a city god temple uh, in um, Rai'an in uh, Wenzhou. And this is a local historian. Uh, so there's a there's this um, along with a religious revival. There's a lot of localism, local identity being reconstructed. So these temples are part of it because uh, the uh, historical sources about the uh, history of this temple, when it was built, when was it restored, who undertook the uh, building and the gathering of local funds to construct this. All this, you know, that that person um, who you know, made uh, great uh, contributions to the building of the temple is memorialized. So this is part of, he's a local historian, and basically he undertakes, he um, is a, an editor for the local gazetteer. This is a late imperial tri uh, Chinese tradition of writing local histories and renewing and updating local histories down to the present. And so uh, local identity is very strong now in parts, different parts of China, especially in Southeast China. This is a new uh, temple uh, to uh, the goddess uh, Chen Jinggu. And uh, the way they were able to get the local government to agree to its construction was um, <clears throat> by saying, oh, we just want to have an entertainment center for our old people. Okay, so it's called a cultural palace for old people. 
Uh, it just so happened that the cultural palace looked very much like a temple. And uh, at first they didn't put in the structure, the, uh, the idols, the uh, statues in, uh, but when they determined that the political climate was right, they put it in. And uh, the government just looks the other way. This is a Buddhist temple. You can see the Song Dynasty um, pagoda in front, but you see this new temple. I'm taking a, the photo from a, a new pagoda that's 15 stories high. And this is uh, the Bodhisattva Guan Yin, five stories tall. And this is a Buddhist festival. And this is uh, a wall mural. You can see the Indian kind of uh, motif that uh, they've adopted for uh, Buddha. This is a Catholic church. This is a Protestant church. And this is inside of a Protestant church. And this is Sunday school for Protestant kids. Uh, this is technically illegal, but it's going on all the time because uh, you're not supposed to give religious education to anyone under the age of 18. Okay, so my conclusion, the ritual economy is the secret of Wendell Model's success, that uh, um, religion is a motivator for business transactions. You want uh, to be commercially, uh, economically successful for your family and for your descendants, and you want to also uh, to do good things, uh, so you, you invest money uh, into the afterlife. So that in the afterlife, and and I didn't have enough time to go into uh, Chinese popular religions' notions of hell with all the tortures that you'll experience in in hell, and uh, have hell you have judges, uh, ten judges who will judge your actions in this world. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Major, for that wide-ranging stimulating presentation. We have about a half an hour, 20, 25 minutes, depending on your interest for conversation. I will warn you that people will come and go to class and so on. You know about these midday events, but we do have some time. Just raise your hand and maybe briefly introduce yourself before asking your question. Do you mind handling it? Okay, sure. Yes. Jose Casanova, you have the Center. Uh, obviously, Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation of the Wetsu model. You yourself has presented it as an isolated area, but yet the rest of China can be seen as a model. So the question is about the relationship between this Wetsu model and the rest of Chinese development. I mean, can it be generalized, that's uh, your, your thesis, to uh, uh, understand the rest of Chinese development? Uh, I think that the reenchantment issue is uh, central. I mean, from the point of view of Weber's theory of rational capitalism, everything going on in China is supposed not to be rational, whether it is kinship capitalism, whether it is state capitalism, whether it is gambling, and yet it works. So there are two issues. One is, can this be generalized? And if not, what is the relation between this model and the other forms of Chinese capitalism that may be not related to religion at all? Yeah. And the second is, uh, um, what does it tell us about uh, our perceived notions of uh, Western rational capitalism if this works so well? Mm -hmm. It's a very, very broad question. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the um, Weber. Yeah, I, I think that this this uh, model proves Weber wrong. Yeah, that, uh, <laughs> that uh, in, the, in Chinese history, you have this uh, very dynamic commercialized economy, and it's all wrapped together with uh, religious impulses. And that's what I was trying to emphasize in this model, that, that Wendrow has this deep connection with the past in China, okay? So, uh, and um, I have written another piece that talks about how uh, in all this uh, discussion about China's emergence as a global economic power, really the o they're only focusing on two kinds of capitalism in China and that is the state capitalism with the mega, mega corporation, the, the mega state corporations, and the foreign investment, as if this was the only thing that was going on in China. So 
so that's why I think it's very important for me to t uh, talk more about this localized kind of indigenous capitalism. This, this kind of capitalism is really what Taiwan started out with. And, and, that, and, and so I think for the purposes of democracy, <laughs> that uh, you know, we're, if we're interested in democracy, this kind of capitalism is much better. Uh, state capitalism, it's basically, you know, those people at the very top, the sons and daughters, wives and relatives of those top officials, that, that, and you need that kind of access to official capital. You need access to office, official power to get anywhere. Uh, and, and those elites uh, at the top, uh, you know, when we call them official capitalists, uh, uh, yeah, official bourgeoisie, uh, they they went out. And um, what was the second part? Of it was to, to which extent can it be generalized? Oh, oh, across China. Yeah, I think um, Southeast China, yes. Uh, but other parts of China, I'm not sure. I haven't really done field work, like the interior. Uh, the, the, the provinces of the interior tend to be poor. And I'm not exactly sure for the reasons. Um, <coughs> I tend to go for cultural reasons, but maybe, you know, there's uh, quite a few political scientists here, so I don't know. Um, the, the culture, there is a kind of rebellious ethos uh, with these people. Uh, although they're not political, okay, they're not politically oriented, uh, but they, they, you know, generally um, don't like uh, interference from you know, top levels of the state. Uh, and in fact, how Wenzhou uh, model uh, got successful was that the uh, Wenzhou officials acted as a shield, protecting the local people. They didn't let um, top officials know about what was actually going on down here, all the privatization. Uh, and uh, they also would issue, like um, in the earlier days when it was uh, actually very risky to be, be very uh, capitalist, uh, they would issue papers for these privately owned family firms saying that they were collectives, which was not true. But they, you know, bore the local stamp of approval and off they went to other parts of China, which were much more in line with the central government. So, uh, but, but uh, a lot of uh, impoverished areas, officials from impoverished areas have come to Wenzhou to try to learn you know, what Wenzhou has that they could uh, take back and, and start development. And so far, there haven't been any successes elsewhere. Hello, um, Marjorie Mandelson, Malzer, fellow anthropologist. Oh, okay. Uh, and I, my question has to do with the kind of uh, a uh, very vivid description you gave when the tombs, tombs were being destroyed, and yet there's also this situation where local lineage hall leaders have uh, managed to uh, have party headquarters inside of what is also a functioning religious lineage hall. And so the question becomes, who's co-opting whom? Mm -hmm. And yet you have the feeling that this is still a bit dysfunctional because of that haunting smashing of stone tombs, those didn't look temporary. Right. And yet, the, and yet they're still being destroyed in the hills. And the frustration of it, it's not just the excess expenditure that it takes, mm -hmm. but it also must be a huge psychological drain mm -hmm. to be continually doing this battle. So I guess my question is, how does the battle switch and get engaged? And how is this, the, you've given us a little bit of a sense of shifting over time towards it getting a little bit more harmonious. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, is it looking like more people, visitors, will come in and not criticize those tools? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. where, where does that cycle get broken? Mm. Well, I think China is changing. You know, it's such a dynamic society, and theoretical frameworks just cannot keep up with. That's why my book is interminable, because China keeps on changing. I'm always trying to be up to date. Um, uh, so one thing uh, is uh, that there is this kind of uh, rapid development of um, uh, religious uh, pilgrimage slash tourism, and that the two are melding into one. And uh, in that way, 
local officials can increasingly see that uh, religion means income and money. Uh, and, um, and tourists coming from other parts of China will also see the Wenzhou model you know, uh, firsthand. Uh, and um, because some of some areas in Wenzhou, the ones I've shown you are pretty local little things. Okay. Uh, there, there are more um, bigger, more impressive, um, you know, monasteries and, and temples where it does attract. Uh, like the, the wooden uh, bodhisattva, that is meant as a major attraction for um, religious tourism. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's the, I talked to the village chief who explained to me his ambitions. And this area was very big Buddhist center. It had 800 monks there in the Song Dynasty. He's trying to revive it. He's even talking about building a Buddhist academy. So there's also this growing sense of uh, prestige, uh, not only for from economic income and that the fact that you're wealthy, but prestige that you can build something. So it's kind of like a phenomenon where in Beijing uh, you have a lot of uh, uh, people who suddenly get wealthy and they're very you know proud of themselves and they just uh, you know disperse all their wealth to you know for their face and people recognize them and they feel very respected but then after a while they feel something lacking and they start to fund some local artists and donate money to some artist uh, colony in Beijing of which there are a lot in Beijing or they want to you know, rub elbows with uh, intellectual elite to heighten their cultural capital. And there's, a, there's that going on too, that local communities in China are looking to building religious, uh, at a very attractive uh, religious center because that also enhances their religious capital. And religious capital is not uh, reducible to economic capital. So uh, as China becomes uh, more prosperous, Economic capital is not going to uh, be sufficient. That uh, whether individuals or communities will be in pursuit of, is increasingly in pursuit of cultural uh, capital. So that's one way to think about it. That uh, uh, that's an optimistic view of things. Yeah. Hi, my name is Li. I'm a graduate student here, and I'm also working in the Berkeley Center. Um, well. My question is kind of built up on her question. Uh, yeah. I know this story that um, Chinese people they they don't ha they don't have the uh, notion of nation until the uh, until the I would say until the Sinian Chinese War because uh, I know this story that uh, until which war Sinian Sino Chinese Sino Japanese Chinese Japanese Chinese, oh, Chinese Sino Japanese, Sino -Chinese. Sino -Chinese. okay yeah. sorry. Um, I know this story in the uh, first opium war. Um, those, like uh, the British troops, the British troops was fighting with the uh, with the government troops, and the uh, people, like village peoples, they were just standing by and watching the uh, fighting as some kind of entertainment. Like you know, it, it's none of their business because they, they 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 don't have this connection with the government, but. Um, there were also a, a bunch of uh, British archaeologists who, uh, who, ca uh, who came with those troops. They were kind of doing treasure hunting in the area. So they kind of uh, opened open up their tombs, the ancestors' tombs, um, and tried to fi uh, find some treasure. And this is when the, uh, the local people were so humiliated. So uh, they uh, and this is when they kind of launched the first battle um, with the foreign troops. And that's, that's what we call <coughs> San Yunli, San Yunli uh, in Guangzhou. It's a battle, it's a famous battle. So um, my question is that uh, all the religion and the rituals you were just talked about belongs to the Han uh, people, the major ethnic group in China. But the Han people's religion is very different from the other minorities. Like, I know Tibetan Buddhism is so different. And how do you think those religion, uh, like, divined their uh, ethnic identity, or uh, how does it build this ethnic identity, but still hold the, uh, uh, 
but still holding the national identity of the whole country. Uh, how do these people maintain their national identity? Yeah, and at uh, the same time, there were minorities over there. You know, they have different religion. Um. Well. Uh, Woody Watson at Harvard University wrote a great uh, um, article called "Standardizing uh, Standardizing Rituals." Yeah, standardizing rituals where he said that uh, two points he made, which I thought were really excellent, was that China is, um, uh, Chinese religion tended to be focused more on ritual orthopraxy than on orthodoxy, than on doctrine, okay? Uh, and so something like Christianity is really, the, the, the text is so important, but Chinese uh, have a long tradition uh, since ancient times of uh, focusing on ritual. And if you look at, uh, you know, that's the sad thing about Confucianism, that in modern times, because uh, of, again, of the Protestant <laughs> thrust into China in 19th century, there was real muscular Protestantism in China, um, where, whereas the Jesuits were much more open-minded before that, uh oh, I hope I'm not <laughs> treading on anybody's toes. Very welcome, very welcome. And so I think uh, the Catholics are better able to understand traditional Chinese religion than the Catholics. They don't read, they don't read the Bible, Catholics. They're not textual religion. Oh, okay, okay. So, <laughs> so um, let's see, what was I going to get at? Uh, orthopraxy. Okay, so what happened to Confucianism was that in modern times, because of the Protestant ethos in China amongst Chinese uh, nationalist elites, uh, they looked down on ritual, you know, all these Chinese kutoing, and, and that seemed so self-demeaning. And um, they, they, Confucianism was by in the hands of both Western Sinologists as well as uh, new Chinese intellectuals was made over into a totally de-ritualized philosophy. It became philosophy and humanism and text. And all that performative uh, aspects of Confucianism that was so important, whether you're talking about state rituals in the imperial capital or popular Confucianism like these lineage rituals. I have a clip I don't, of a Confucian ancestor uh, ritual don't have time to show you, uh, that, that that was totally forgotten. And uh, so Woody Watson's argument is that in, in China's past, th there was a standardization of ritual, that that was one way uh, that uh, you could bring all these disparate uh, tribal groups and minority groups and local areas, local communities in line with the center. It was done through ritual the performative, through ingrainment of habitus into the body. So, uh, for example, the uh, <coughs> lineage ancestor sacrifice ritual that I studied, I've written, written a chapter on it, haven't published it, because I'm <laughs> waiting to publish my book. Um, you know, if you, if you look at it, uh, the, the, how they reconstructed this ritual in the 1980s was by interviewing old people, but also who remembered, who were like this cook uh, for the sacrifice in the old days. But they also looked to the liturgy. And this liturgy is a Ming Dynasty version of Zhu Xi's Jiali family rituals. And this was widely disseminated. This was a standardizing move uh, to homogenize all the rituals throughout the imperium. And because uh, Zhu Xi was writing at a time when the printing industry was widely disseminated so that you could find this text in Korea, in Japan even. And this was a way through ritual to bring all local communities in line with the center. So that was one thing uh, that, and it's not just Confucianism, but Buddhism also had their standardized rituals. Taoism was a great unifier throughout China. Everywhere that Taoism spread to, throughout the empire, they would encounter local tribal religions. They would say, those gods are not as powerful as ours. And in this way, Taoism also acted to unify 
China, even though there was no centralized uh, religious institution of Taoism and Buddhism like the Christian church. There is a young scholar, I don't get Chao, I don't know if you know him. He's gone to Oxford or somewhere, and then he was at Harvard before. But he has studied a temple in Shanxi. Yes, yes, I know him. Yeah. Have you, have you read that study? Yes. Uh -huh. And that does seem a little bit like these metropolitan developments in a poor place. Yes. And one would suppose that it might flower if, if the economy there, mm -hmm. and, and perhaps in conjunction with the natural growth. Yes. Yes, um, it's very similar. Um, and he uh, emphasizes the participation of local officials mm -hmm. uh, in these uh, rituals and in the festivities. Yeah. Um, yeah. I did have a question, which is these lineages in, in the Wenzhou area. First, what is the Chinese term that's used for them? Rituals? Lineage. Uh, lineage. Uh, Zongzu. Zongzu. Uh -huh. Okay, and then? The other thing is that they still run schools and they set up financial trusts the way they did famously in prior time. Yeah, they, they have some, <coughs> the lineages are not as thriving, I think, as the temples. I mean, the, this Wang lineage, they had some ideas about <coughs> um, creating, uh, taking one uh, individual and making that person a kind of um, legal entity to represent lineage as a whole, so that creating a factory for the lineage uh, whose proceeds would go, but that never took off. Uh, I think the problem may be that, you know, the older, the, most of these lineages are run by older uh, men, and they, they really come from the older society of the Maoist era. They really don't know how to do it. Yeah, that. yeah, so they're not very savvy. Um, so it really depends on um, the individuals, but in general, I think um, I've uh, uh, read a paper by a Chinese uh, scholar and anthropologist in China who did say that uh, as a whole, lineages have not been as uh, uh, fast in development and as successful as uh, temple associations. Um, so I, you know, lineages may have, um, I know that this uh, very often, Ancestor halls were taken over in um, the early days of the Communist Revolution and turned into schools. And even in Republican China, many ancestor halls were taken over and turned into schools. Mm -hmm. So there is that link with education. I think basically right now the lineages in Wintrow, they basically they will give charity money to widows, to orphans, and uh, sometimes to poor families to fund their children's education. But uh, I haven't heard anything about running schools, at most a little kindergarten. Mm -hmm. uh, or they may rent out their space to a privately run uh, kindergarten. Thank you. Yes. Um, um, mostly this model seems to sort of bring religious revival into the fold of things that are good for China's future, especially economically. But what happens um, sort of when it, it the religious revival, whatever group sort of reaches a, uh, uh, or goes in a direction that is then perceived by the central government as being not in national interests and thus sort of mm -hmm. put it into the fold of something that becomes illegal under mm -hmm. the Constitution. Yeah, then they go after it with a vengeance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So right now, you know, the, the, the government, the local government knows that these Protestant churches are um, illegally doing Sunday more, uh, school, but they'll, they'll send somebody out and like, I was actually visiting one of these Catholic churches and a local official came and they, there was a kind of yelling match uh, over, you're not supposed to do this, but it's, it's really, they, they're not going to take drastic action un, unless, you know, they're, they're preaching um, sedition or something like that. Yes. Yeah, I was also in the Alabama <coughs> from Thai University. Um, from your field work, um, I mean, what would you say, how large is Christianity actually in Wenzhou? Because one reads in many articles that Wenzhou is considered to be the Jerusalem of China, and that Christianity yeah. is large there. Yeah. And um, this is one question. The second question is, um, I know that Christianity, Chinese Christianity has um, regional coloring. So I wanted to know whether from the studies that you did there, you could find that there is like 
something like a specific when you um, <coughs> like protest in Christianity because I know that in some regions they really take um, lots of old rituals within their specific mm -hmm. Christianity activities. Yeah, this is a pity because I wasn't <coughs> focusing on uh, Christians. Uh, I guess in my own mind, uh, I I have a kind of conflicts about Christianity myself uh, in China. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't eager, and then because most of the Christians in Wenzhou are illegal, uh, technically illegal, they're, they're non-registered on the ground. Uh, and I was warned several times, and I've been hauled into the public security office several times. I was warned that not to touch the Christians. And the Christians that I did encounter were kind of uh, very furtive and, and everything just seemed very scary and I didn't want to jeopardize my field work. So I just basically avoided, for the most part, the Christians. Uh, but things are better in recent uh, years. Um, it, it's more relaxed, but the number according to, and I forgot this name, maybe you know, he, uh, he has written, um, has done a big estimate of the numbers of Christians uh, underground. Yu yes. Yu uh, internet. Uh, he, on the internet, he uh, has published a, a very significant piece about uh, Christians in China. He estimates that uh, the numbers of non-registered Christians in China is two-thirds of all the Christians. So if you count in the non-registered ones, it would be huge numbers of Christians spreading mainly in the countryside. It's a very growing force, very rapid. So what is the number of official Christians? Uh, official yeah. Christians, Sorry. it's like what? 2,000, uh, Two, uh, 20, 20 million. 20 million. And, uh, and on the ground, 40 so million? Well, two thirds was 60 million, three times. Well, uh, 40 I mean, it's two 60 times. million, like yes. Yeah. Um, well, but in Wenzhou, I think Wenzhou's total population is about 7 million, and probably about, uh, one-sixth of them are Christians. And of course, the, 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 the revival of uh, religions in Guangzhou has caused a lot of uh, um, conflicts in civil society, too. I mean, if you can say that China has a civil society. So uh, then the government, the local government, then has this uh, role of adjudicating between, um, um, you know, conflicting um, religious groups, maybe fights over water, land, and, and uh, practices. Like, uh, you know, for example, the Wang lineage, they don't like, they say they like the Catholics better than the Protestants because when they want uh, to solicit donations for uh, ritual act ancestor rituals or uh, fixing up the ancestor hall, it's always the Catholics who are willing to give, and the Protestants say, "No, you're superstitious, <laughs> you're idolatrous, you're you know," and so they find that the Protestants are not community oriented. The Protestants just want to be on their own, and they find that unacceptable. So then the local government has this important role of of uh, you know mediating between conflicting groups. 